<laughs> okay, it's on. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, um, this morning, being Easter weekend, I, I wrote something on Facebook where I would normally write something about the lesson. Uh, you know, it said, come on out to the Bravo Coffee Company. I, I wrote something about Easter, and uh, I'm going to share it with you before we even begin. All right. So, let me find where I have it. Okay. So, it says right here, Today is Holy Saturday. The tomb that held the body of Jesus Christ was sealed and guarded by the Roman soldiers. To the Jewish leaders, this rock meant that the heresy they thought was being spoken was now ended with the death of Jesus Christ. To the Romans, this rock symbolized the end of a rebellion, and maybe now they can enjoy peace in Jerusalem, that is, until the next uprising. To the disciples, this rock meant their leader, their friend, their mentor, their God was dead. It made them question everything you were taught, if even for a brief moment. To Mary, this rock was a heavy weight that crushed her soul. Her son was just beyond her reach, and she could no longer hold and cherish Jesus as she did when he was a baby. To Satan, this rock meant victory. He honestly thought he won. But beyond the stone, Jesus descended into hell and took from Satan the keys of death in the grave. Satan realized at this point he will never, ever, ever be like God, and soon he will die a horrifying death. What a reality check that was. To the angels, this rock meant no one ever, ever would attack their holy God again. They were restricted from drawing their swords at the crucifixion as they saw the Roman soldiers beating and crucifying Jesus. But now they could forever guard the rock that covered the tomb where Jesus lay. But to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, this stone meant it was finished. For what took place behind the stone was truly remarkable. The sacrifice that began on Good Friday was carried over into Saturday behind the stone. Jesus, as the high priest, presented himself as a living sacrifice before the Father. By his blood, he paid for the sins of all mankind once and for all. Then on Easter Sunday morning, the stone meant our sins and heavy burdens were rolled away. Jesus rolled away that stone and proclaimed, I am alive forevermore. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John eleven twenty five, 25. And because he lives, we can live too. Happy Easter, mm -hmm. Pastor Oliver. And, and uh, tell you what took place this weekend 2,000 years ago. Wow. If we understood the cost, the price that was paid, I mean, it literally bankrupted heaven. It, it cost God everything. He gave his only son. God didn't have to offer that sacrifice. Jesus easily could have said no. In fact, he even prayed, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But he said, nevertheless, it's not as I will, it's as you will. He submitted to his Father in the pain and agony. And when Jesus prayed that prayer, he wasn't on the cross. He was in the garden praying. Because at that point, our sins were beginning to be poured out upon him. He was feeling the, 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 the stench of the sin. For the first time in his life, he knew what it was like to be a sinner, never before. Sin and God have always been separated, but for that one moment, sin was attacking God, and he was saying, bring it on. It was the only way we could be saved. And for us to scoff at that or to look back at Easter as just a holiday and not realizing the price that was paid, it's unconscionable. <laughs> I mean, we gotta remember, we gotta think, we gotta go back. Just praise God. <laughs> Amen. Uh, with that said, let's get into today's lesson. Um, the uh, where on this, uh, Acts 24, is Caesarea. Again, it's Herod's palace. It's the same year as the last chapter, 60 AD. The key people here are going to be Paul, Ananias the high priest, Tertullus, who's a lawyer, Governor Phoenix, and Drusilla, his wife. 
the key events, Paul presents his case before Governor Felix with Ananias, the high priest, and Tertullus, the lawyer present. He then speaks to Governor Felix in, with his wife, Drusilla, alone. Uh, Paul does. Uh, the books that are written are the same as last chapter. We have Mark, Matthew, Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, uh, Luke, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, Colossians, and uh, those are the books that are written. And the Roman emperors are the same. Uh, uh, right now, uh, it's um, actually do, 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 do. Nero is the uh, emperor right now. He reigned from uh, 54 to 68 AD. Now, let's go into Acts 24. So Acts 24 uh, begins this. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. Now, when, we, when we're studying the Bible, it's important that we catch certain phrases and words because there's some, some things that will always tie things together. Like when we see a, the word therefore, we should always go back because therefore is tying something together. Uh, one professor told me, when we see therefore, we have to go and look see why it's therefore, what it's there for. Uh, so when we see therefore, or when we see a phrase, and then we, or and then, or in this case, days later, and it was five days later, we should go back and see, well, what happened five days earlier? And in this case, Paul was transferred from Caesarea to Jerusalem uh, because of a plot that was discovered by Paul's nephew. So that ties it to this chapter. So after that plot was discovered, five days later, and after he was brought, brought to Caesarea, five days later is where this ch chapter takes place. Verse 2, when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. Now watch the pomp and the circumstance, the, you, know, you know, or the pomp and the, uh, the uh, ordinate way he, he presents himself. And there's really nothing wrong with that. In fact, when we're before judges, it'd be smart to be this way. Uh, Paul says, or, or Felix says, we've enjoyed a long period of peace under you, for your foresight has brought uh, about reforms to this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order that we not weary you further, I request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. So he gave a little honor, and he presents his case. Um, Proverbs 15.1 uh, Proverbs 15, says, A general answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. So be gentle with those. I mean, if you get in, in, in the judge's face, chances are it's not going to go well for you. If you ever watch YouTube, uh, you'll see people that have got before the judge and just got smart with it. And they turned a, you know, a misdemeanor or, or you know, maybe a probation into a five-year prison sentence. And the more they talked, the more years the judge added. You know, we got to be careful when we do that. Um, for some reason, it's always these young girls, too, that they catch, you know. So it was like a young girl that was drinking, I remember watching this one. She was in there for a DUI and he kept adding more years because she kept getting smart with him. You know, you can't judge me, you can't do this, you can't do that. And the judge says, watch. <laughs> <laughs> you think you'd learn your lesson. Mm. All right, verse five. Now, what I'm gonna show you guys right here is something really, 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 super really interesting. <laughs> All right, verse five. We found this man to be a troublemaker, stirred up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is the ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. All the things he said right there are his view of what happened. But that's not the amazing thing I wanna show you. Look at uh, the very next verse. What, what does it say? Read me verse 7, somebody. There is no verse 7, is there? If you read the uh, uh, NIV, there is no verse 7. 
In fact, if you go and read the NIV online, it'll show a, a letter A inside a, a bracket. And if you click on that, it'll show you what verse 7 would have said, said. But if you read the King James, there is a verse 7. Mm -hmm. You read the other translation, there is. NIV chose not to put that in. Uh, and if you click on the little, the little A in the brackets, it'll give an explanation as to why. Here, here, here's what it says right here. Uh, some manuscripts include him here. And we have all... Uh, oh, some manuscripts include... Uh, we have judged him in accordance with the law. But the commander, Lysias, uh, came and took him from us with much violence, according to his accusers, uh, to come before you. The King James includes in verse 7 and 8. It says here, But the chief captain, uh, Lysias, came upon us with great violence, took, away, took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself uh, mayest take knowledge of these things wherein we accuse him. So NIV chose not to put it in. There's another part in the scripture where you'll read, uh, if you're reading the NIV, that they will, um, a portion of scripture, I believe it's in Mark, it'll say uh, earlier manuscripts don't include these next few verses, but they left the verses there. But they said it doesn't include these verses. Whereas you read the King James, they are there. And the thing is, you can't always go by the earliest manuscripts. You've got to go by the most accurate. And um, I believe that uh, the scripture we have today, whether it be King James, NIV, uh, American Standard, they had done their homework. It's there, it's solid. Mm -hmm. So if you ever see something like that in the scripture, uh, and NIV is the one I notice does it the most, just read another version and it'll tell you what that verse is. Okay? It's just when they put it together, they thought, well, maybe that verse really doesn't belong here, but you can't always go by the earliest manuscripts. All right? Uh, verse 8. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about these things we are, are bringing against him. The other uh, Jews joined into this accusation, asserting that these were true. And what uh, uh, Craig said earlier is this has a lot to do with Easter Sunday, the crucifixion. And we got uh, the high priest there. We got people joining in. So he did blasphemies. He did this. He did that. Crucify him. Rid the world of, you know, everything. And we see it happening again right now. Uh, verse 10. When the governor uh, motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know for a number of years that you've been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. Paul, like Tertullus, gave praise to the person, the, the judge. Uh, remember, Proverbs 51, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stirs up anger. He says uh, in verse 11, Paul, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. So I told you earlier that this chapter takes place in 60 AD. Did you know by that verse right there we can tell when it took place in the year? How, how can we tell that? He said, 12 days earlier I went up to Jerusalem to worship. How do we know what month he is in? How do we know if it's spring, summer, winter, or fall? Anybody? Close, not Passover. Something to do with Passover. Something that's coming up for us in June, Pentecost. Remember, Paul went to Pentecost. If we go back several chapters, Paul was in Ephesus, remember? He says, I want to make it to Passover. I want to make it to Jerusalem for Passover. So 12 days ago, it was Passover. So we know that this is taking place actually right about the same time it is right now today. Because this uh, this Easter Passover is really late in the year. A lot of times it's in early April, and sometimes it's even in March. Last year. Did you folks see the full moon last night? It was incredible. It was. Incredible. I saw it just above the horizon. Oh, me too. Just, me whoa. too. Um, you know what the sad thing was? We were driving up through our subdivision, and we saw the moon rising. I go, Grace, 
I want to get home and I want to uh, get a picture of this. But new houses popped up and they were blocking the view. I had to drive back out of the subdivision a little ways to get the picture of this. And my, my camera didn't do it justice, but it was gorgeous. Mm. It was oranges. Yeah. It's called a pink moon, uh, a pink full moon in April. It has nothing to do with the color of the moon. It has to do with uh, 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 this flower that's native to North America that's pink and it blooms. There's a pollen in the air. But it doesn't change the color. But last night it was purple or purple orange. orange. And it was gorgeous orange. Yeah. But I've seen like that. It, was, it was beautiful. Some clouds were crossing in front of it. And the thing about the, the Passover moon is Passover takes place on the first full moon past the spring equinox. Um, and it just happens that 28 days ago, that's the cycle of the moon, the full moon happened on the equinox. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't count that one. Had that full moon been a day before, Passover would have been that weekend. Right. So it would have been that weekend 28 days ago. I'm talking about the science here, but that's how, how they do it. But because the full moon happened on Passover, this is the first full moon past Passover. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I say that to tell you this, that what we're reading right here took place roughly 2,000 years ago at the same time of the year we're in right now. Paul is before Felix right at this time of the year. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and, and just by learning little things like that in Scripture, you can tell when he said 12 days ago. we got to go back in our mind. What happened 12 days ago? He was in Jerusalem for, for Pentecost. Yeah. Pentecost is 50 days past, past Passover. So if Passover would have been in early um, uh, uh, April or late March, uh, Pentecost would be mid May. Uh, in mid May, this time it's going to be in June. So we're, we're roughly a little bit before this time, but it's about this time of the year, which is pretty interesting. Huh? Cool. Uh, it says, verse 12 My accusers, Paul saying, did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you uh, the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. See how the way is uh, capitalized? Which they call a sect. I believe everything in accordance with the law that is written in the prophets. Now the word way is capitalized uh, is referred to the church. And it's used seven times in the New Testament, all in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the only place where you're going to find the way capitalized. Because it, it's not saying, hey, take this way or that way. But when they talk about the way uh, as, as, a, as a thing, uh, it's used seven times. That was the sixth time. The seventh time will be later on in this chapter. Uh, but it's ironic that the word Christian is only mentioned two times in the New Testament. <laughs> And they're both in Acts. Uh, Acts 11.26 says, um, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In uh, Acts 26.28, we're going to read in a few weeks, it says, and Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? But, but the way is mentioned seven times. But I bring this up to let you know that there is actually a cult called the Way International. And when we think of the Way, we think, wow, I heard about that in the book of Acts. But now that we've read it several times, the Way, I want to warn you folks ahead of time that there is a cult out there called the Way International. Uh, the Way International has two beliefs that are not consistent with, or that are consistent with every Christian cult. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ, big red flag, mm. and they believe that you're saved by works. Another big red flag. Um, and it's important that you don't fall for those things. Uh, there are certain things that it, you've got to believe to be a Christian. Uh, and there's a lot of religions out there. Uh, there's cults and there's occults, you know, where they actually worship demonic, you know, Satan and all that. But a cult is where there's like a twist on, on the word of God. Uh, in fact, 
the the Jews thought Christianity was a cult. You know, they thought it was a they believed it was a sect of Judaism, but they considered that cultish. You know, because they denied Moses, they denied the law, they denied the prophets, which they really didn't. Um, but it's important that you know those things. Um, to be considered Christian, you almost have to adhere to the Apostles' Creed that was way back in like the early first or second century that says, I believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son, I believe in the virgin birth, the deity of Christ. There are certain things you have to believe. If you take any of those away, it's, it, it's cultish. I mean, it's not good. So, and they, they did, they don't believe in the deity of Christ. Um, and you can look that up on many different websites. Their own, they may not tell you that. But there's other websites you can go to and say, what do they believe? Oh. Verse 15. Now Paul says, And I have the same hope in God that these, as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive to keep my conscience clear before God and man. He, he strives to keep his conscience clear which before God and man. Um, I want to read something. Maybe it's coming up here. It says, And after absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring uh, my people gifts for the poor and present offerings. I was ceremonially clean. Now remember, th this is important, verse 18, because Paul is going to teach you in Romans. He's going to teach you in Corinthians and in Galatians, especially Galatians, um, where he will say we are saved by, our, 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 by grace, not by works. He will say, you foolish Galatians. He's talking about, remember we were talking about um, circumcision. Who bewitched you into believing this? You know, blah, 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 blah. And you, when you read Paul, you begin to think, you know, he didn't follow the law at all. Where Jesus said not one jot or tittle will fall from the law. Remember? Not even one little scratch mark from the law is going to disappear. Then Paul comes along and said, you are saved by grace through faith, not the roots of these things should boast. So if you were to take that as itself saying, Christians, we don't need good works. You don't know Paul. Because Paul says right here, in verse 18, I was ceremonially clean. He still adhered to the law. He realized that Christ fulfilled the law, but he still did what was right. Uh, he says, when they found me in the temple, there was no crowd with me. I wasn't involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have any against me. Or these who are here should state uh, what crime they found in me as I, when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was the one thing that I stood uh, shouted as I stood in their presence. It's concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm trying before today. So Paul brings it up again. I can imagine him looking over his shoulders. Did I divide him again? <laughs> you know, Because remember, he divided him. And I can imagine Paul saying, Here's my key phrase. <laughs> Where is my backup? Hey, you know. But it didn't happen. But then Felix, who was acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When uh, Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered that the centurion keep Paul under guard and to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So Paul was in prison, but it was a very light prison. He had some freedom, which was really, really good. But who was Felix? Anybody know? We know Felix the cat and Felix from the odd couple. Other than that, we probably never heard Felix uh, before in our lives, usually, except in the Bible. Uh, Felix was actually uh, uh, the governor of Judea. Uh, he, was, he was Claudius, the emperor, put him there in 52 AD. He was cruel. He took bribes. And we're going to see that in a minute. He had Jonathan, the high priest, actually killed. And he would send many priests over to Rome to have them killed when he disagreed with them. So he was kind of a ruthless man. But um, he, he was also um, married three times. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's not in here. He was actually... Um, uh, a Greek that was a freed man, and so was his brother, who was also pretty famous. They they were slaves at one time, and they became free. 
Um, I don't know what price they paid to get it, but they got it. Then they rose up within the ranks. Now his brother worked right with the emperor. And uh, this guy here, Felix, he got in trouble. And we're going to see here that he leaves uh, Judea pretty quick. You, actually, in the next chapter. It wasn't because he died. He was summoned back to uh, Rome. And it was his brother that got him off. He said, listen, this is my brother. I vouch for him, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and we learned that from Josephus, not from the scripture, because scripture didn't reveal that. But um, Felix, he was married three times. Uh, not at the same time, but three different wives. Two of them were named Drusilla. And two of the wives had the same name, Drusilla. It's his second wife, Drusilla, we're going to see in this chapter. She was Jewish. And all three women were princesses. But this one was the niece of Agrippa, King Agrippa I. So his wife is a, 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 a princess of Queen Agrippa the First, King Agrippa the First. That's why if we go back into verse 22, it says this, that Felix, who was well acquainted with the way or journey proceedings, he knew about Christianity. He wasn't just some Roman. He knew because his wife was Jewish. He, he knew these things. Verse 24, it says this, and several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, I wish it would say, who was the niece of Agrippa the first, it doesn't, but we know that from history. Uh, he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ. Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Again, if Paul said we, we don't need any Christian works, he wouldn't have talked about, about righteousness. He wouldn't have talked about self-control. He wouldn't have talked about judgment to come. He would have said, oh, we're free in Christ. But Paul realized you must have good works. The good works are the proof of the, of the pudding, if you will. It is, yes, we are saved by grace, but if there are not works to prove that grace, is it really grace that we have? If the gospel we're preaching and the gospel we're adhering to does not have as an end result of changed life, is it really the gospel we're adhering to? And, and that's something Paul was talking to Felix about. Um, Felix was afraid at what Paul was saying and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. And when I find it convenient, I will send for you. Um, the power of a testimony, the power of the word of God, the blood of the Lamb, it can convict the most ruthless of men. Yeah, it's just like, uh, just like King Herod with uh, John the Baptizer. Oh, he yeah. kept going, drawn to him, but then be, you know, taken back by what he had to say. Yeah, you're taken back because why? He didn't want to, John the Baptist convicted him of marrying his brother's wife. And he didn't want to hear that. He says, yes, I want your God. Yes, I want your righteousness, but I'm not giving up this woman. I'm not giving up my sin. And the same thing here with, with Felix. He wasn't ready to give up what he wanted. He still loved taking bribes, and we're going to read that in a minute. He still loved his wickedness, but he was hungry for that righteousness at the same time. Uh, and he was afraid. But that's why he kept calling Paul back. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, even dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Felix was being convicted of what Paul said. Revelation 12.11 says this, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Your testimony is powerful. You know, a person can say, I, I, maybe I don't believe in God. I don't believe in any things you believe. But they cannot deny your testimony. When they see a changed life, that's something that sets them back. Science doesn't explain that. But, wow, power of their testimony. Right here. Uh, verse 26. At the same time, he was hoping Paul would offer him a bribe. So he was afraid, but he was hoping Paul would offer him a bribe. That's how he made his money. So he sat for him frequently and talked to them. It's a funny thing about greed. People actually sell their soul for just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Uh, last night, Grace and I watched The Passion of the Christ. 
And I remember um, Judas standing there in the temple, bewildered at what he had did. He was possessed with the devil, the Bible says, at that point. But the man in him was shocked that it went to that extent. And he took the money. He says, I don't want this. You take it. And he, no. Nope. And it, Judas threw it to them. And uh, we, we want, we want, we want, we want all these things. Then when we have them, it doesn't satisfy. Boy, we should seek righteousness. That's, that's what satisfies. Verse 27. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by uh, Porcius, Porcius, whatever his name is, Festus. So we just know it's Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant favor with the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Hmm. And at this point, Felix is actually summoned over to Rome, and he has to answer for some of the things he did. But Felix could have left him, could have set him free. But because of the Jews, he left him in prison. And that is the end of Acts 24. The next chapter, we're going to see Paul before uh, Festus. And Festus, where have we heard that name before? Gunsmoke. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Gunsmoke. <laughs> ah, that's right. But uh, we're going to read about him uh, in 24. Uh, we're going to read about uh, Agrippa in 26. Then in 27, 28, we're going to see Paul. It's not really called a missionary journey, but it's his journey to Rome. And we're going to see uh, the years are going to fly by. In the next few chapters, right now we're in 60 AD. By the time chap the chapter ends, we'll be in 66 AD. And a lot of things will happen at that point. Peter the Apostle will actually be dead at that point. The Apostle Peter. So that is uh, 24. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. Boy, it's powerful. It changes lives. And, and as we read it, not knowing the history or culture, uh, when we study to learn about it, it even becomes more amazing. It, it's like we can peel layer after layer and find more and more depth to it. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. We thank you for history. Uh, we thank you for uh, Josephus who wrote all these things down. We thank you for Luke who uh, wrote these things down. We thank you for every one of your, uh, uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ who over the last 2,000 years preserved the Word of God so beautifully that we could have it today. We thank you for the transformation that took place on the cross. The Bible says you became our sin. We became your righteousness. The Bible doesn't say you just took our sin and we took your righteousness. It said you became our sin. We became your righteousness. That was an exchange that took place that we will always, always be grateful for. Oh God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far about anything? No? All right, we only got a few weeks to go. Um, when are you leaving, Pam? Um. We're going to have the barbecue on the 11th. Okay, I might right. still be here. Okay. Whoever you are, I hope you are, because you missed it last year. Thank you.